35 years ago, on March 13, 1989, Canadian Broadcast Corporation National News reported that early this morning, 6 million people across Quebec woke up to darkness and disbelief. The entire province, it seems, had been hit by a power failure. The people of Quebec were victims of what Dr. David Bettler, the head of the Space Weather Group at Natural Resources Canada, described as the biggest geomagnetic storm of the space age. It is history that deserves to be remembered. According to a 2019 edition of the journal Solar Physics, the idea of a cyclical sun was first hypothesized by Danish astronomer Christian Horbo, who wrote in 1775 that it appears that after the course of a certain number of years, the appearance of the sun repeats itself with respect to the number and size of the spots. But it wasn't until 1843 that German astronomer Heinrich Schwab published a record of his observing the sun every day for 17 years in search of a theoretical planet he hypothesized that would exist inside the orbit of Mercury. He never found the planet that he called Vulcan, but his careful record-keeping of solar events allowed him to, for the first time, discover and estimate the life of a solar cycle. The solar cycle actually is driven by the sun's powerful magnetic field. NASA explains that every 11 years or so, the sun's magnetic field completely flips. And this means that the sun's north and south poles switch places. And it takes about another 11 years for the sun's north and south poles to flip back again. This magnetic shift affects the sun's activity, which can then affect Earth in numerous ways. Something called space weather. And thus, solar activity is used to define solar cycles. The beginning of a solar cycle is a solar minimum, or when the sun has the least sunspots. Over time, solar activity and the number of sunspots increases. The middle of the solar cycle is the solar maximum, or when the sun has the most sunspots. As the cycle ends, it fades back to the solar minimum, and then a new cycle begins, NASA explains. Based on Schwab's findings, Swiss astronomer Rudolf Wolf was able to search back through the history of recording solar activity all the way back to Galileo to identify previous solar cycles. The earliest cycle for which there was sufficient observational data to identify occurred between February 1755 and June 1766. Wolf published his results in 1852, and thus the 1755 solar cycle has been conventionally called Solar Cycle 1 and cycles since have been numbered from there. Solar cycle 22 lasted just short of a decade, beginning in September 1986 and ending in August 1996. Solar cycle 22 distinguished itself early. In 1988, R.J. Thompson wrote in Solar Physics, The new solar cycle, denoted cycle 22, has risen faster than any of the previous 21 cycles, indicating that the cycle is likely to be of a large amplitude. The Australian Space Weather Forecasting Center explains early in the cycle, the smooth sunspot number, determined by the number of sunspots visible on the sun and uses the traditional measure of the cycle, climbed rapidly, in fact more rapidly than for any previous recorded cycle. That is, the time it took for the cycle to rise to its maximum number of sunspots was just 3.2 years, leading to early predictions that cycle 22 could become the highest cycle on record. While that would not ultimately be the case, the rapid rise in sunspot activity did lead to what the Australian Space Weather Forecasting Center describes as some extraordinary intervals of activity. Prime amongst these was the March 1989 period, which started on March 6th, with the appearance of a large sunspot region on the eastern edge of the sun. NASA explains that the observed spots in the sun are where magnetic fields are strongest, and thus associated with solar flares, which the NASA webpage writes, happen when the powerful magnetic fields in and around the sun reconnect. Solar flares are large drivers of space weather. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration explains that solar flares are large eruptions of electromagnetic radiation from the sun, lasting from minutes to hours. The sudden outburst of electromagnetic energy travels at the speed of light, and therefore any effect upon the sunlight side of Earth's exposed outer atmosphere occurs at the same time that the event is observed. These flares can produce different kinds of energy, each affecting the Earth in various ways. The strength of solar flares varies and is measured on a scale. The NASA webpage writes the smallest ones are B-class, followed by C, M, and X, the largest. 
Similar to the Richter scale for earthquakes, each letter represents a tenfold increase in energy output. So an X is 10 times an M and 100 times a C. Over 14 days, starting March 6th, the Australian Space Weather Forecasting Center writes, the sun produced 11 X-class flares and 48 M-class. The Associated Press quoted astronomer Tom Duvall about a flare on March 9th. The reports I got from Sacramento Peak Sunspot Solar Observatory is that it's the largest one they've ever seen. Ever. The flare was described as 36 times the size of the Earth. Solar flares can represent a massive amount of energy. The website of NASA Earth Observatory writes that solar flares, among the solar system's mightiest eruptions, are tremendous explosions in the atmosphere of the sun, capable of releasing as much energy as a billion megatons of TNT. Caused by the sudden release of magnetic energy, in just a few seconds, flares can accelerate solar particles to very high velocities, almost to the speed of light, and heat solar material to tens of millions of degrees. But the Earth has its protection against solar flares. NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center writes, solar flares produce high-energy particles and radiation that are dangerous to living organisms. However, on the surface of the Earth, we are well protected from the effects of solar flares by the Earth's magnetic field and atmosphere. The most dangerous emissions from flares are energetic charged particles, primarily high-energy protons, and electromagnetic radiation, primarily X-rays. The X-rays from flares are stopped by our atmosphere, well above the Earth's surface. But that doesn't mean that the flares are harmless, the Goddard Space Flight Center continues. They do disturb the Earth's ionosphere, however, which in turn disturbs radio communications. Along with energetic ultraviolet radiation, they heat the Earth's outer atmosphere, causing it to expand, and this increases the drag on Earth-orbiting satellites, reducing their lifetime in orbit. The Associated Press wrote on March 13th, the violent eruptions created the potential to disrupt long-range communications on Earth, such as shortwave transmissions and satellite links. The effect was at least noticeable. For example, radio transmissions were disrupted for America Radio Liberty, which broadcasts to the Soviet Union, with the Associated Press reporting that dissidents in Moscow said Radio Liberty's broadcasts were jammed to block its reports on anti-government demonstrations and detentions in Moscow, Leningrad, and two other Soviet cities. When engineers investigated, they could find no evidence that the Soviets were, as the dissidents assumed, jamming the station. Rather, they cited the solar flares as a possible cause. Likewise, Australian units serving a peacekeeping role in Namibia suffered communication breakdowns owing to their dependence on older, high-frequency radios, complicating operations with units deployed across large areas distant from headquarters. While neither of these events could be said to be exactly devastating, it's easy to see how such disruptions at a critical moment could have had deadly consequences. For example, the website of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation notes that frequencies used by commercial pilots also suffered fade-outs. And operations in space didn't have the same protection that we have down here on Earth. In his 2000 book, The 23rd Cycle, Learning to Live with a Stormy Star, astronomer Sten Odenwald notes that communication satellites that sense the Earth's magnetic field in order to point themselves had to be manually repointed from the ground, as the local field polarity reversed direction, causing satellites to try to flip upside down. Other satellites, he writes, tumbled out of control for several hours, and weather satellite communications were disrupted, delaying weather images used for weather forecasting. Perhaps more ominously, Space Shuttle Discovery, in the midst of a mission, experienced what the Orlando Sentinel described as a problem with the Space Shuttle's electrical system. The Sentinel quoted Mission Director Granville Pennington that a sensor on a critical fuel tank is exhibiting a pressure signature that we've never seen before. We're trying to understand what's going on. The issue caused NASA to consider reducing the length of the mission. Odenwall writes, No public connection was ever made between the instrument-reading glitch and the solar storm, but it's fair to say that the conjunction of these two events was not completely by chance. But there was a more dire impact of the event, as the sun was throwing more at the Earth than solar flares. NASA describes coronal mass ejections as huge bubbles of coronal plasma threaded by intense magnetic field lines that are ejected from the sun over the course of several hours. CMEs are different from solar flares. For example, they travel more slowly, but they often accompany solar flares. Space.com explains that scientists are still not exactly sure how the two events are related.
Dr. Battler reported in a 2019 edition of the journal Space Weather that two coronal mass injections, the first associated with an X4.5 flare on 10 March and the second linked to an M7.3 flare on 12 March, caused a geomagnetic storm on March 13th. The effects of the storm could be seen spectacularly across a wide section of the globe. The Science Times reported in 2023, the massive solar plasma cloud, a gas of electrically charged particles, ultimately impacted the Earth's magnetic field on Monday, March 12th. As far south as Florida and Cuba, dazzling northern lights were produced by the ferocity of this geomagnetic storm. The website solarstorms.org writes, Alaskan and Scandinavian observers were treated to a spectacular auroral display that night. Intense colors from the rare Great Aurora painted the skies around the world in vivid shapes that moved like legendary dragons. Ghostly celestial armies battled from sunset to midnight. Newspapers that reported this event considered the Aurora itself to be the most newsworthy aspect of the storm. Seen as far south as Florida and Cuba, the vast majority of people in the Northern Hemisphere had never seen such a spectacle. These views of the Northern Lights so far south caused some concern, with the Associated Press reporting that police 911 emergency lines lit up as worried sky watchers thought that they had spotted wildfires or falling debris from the space shuttle Discovery. While Space Weather Archive writes that some onlookers thought that they were witnessing a nuclear exchange. But while the Northern Lights were being seen farther south than they had been in a lifetime, in Quebec, the lights went out. Odenwall explains that the storm had impacted the magnetic field of the Earth and caused a powerful jet stream of current to flow a thousand miles above the ground. Like a drunken serpent, its coils gyrated and swooped downwards in latitude, deep into North America. A river of charged particles and electrons in the ionosphere flowed from west to east, inducing powerful electrical currents in the ground that surged into many natural nooks and crannies. There beneath the surface, natural rock resistance murdered them quietly in the night. Nature has its own effective defenses for these currents, but human technology was not so fortunate on this particular night. The currents eventually found harbor in the electrical systems of Great Britain, the United States, and Canada. Simply put, when the Earth resisted the currents, they found another path into the high-voltage transmission lines of Hydro-Quebec's electricity transmission system. The Science Times explains that Quebec is particularly at risk. The province is situated on an electrical inefficient Precambrian igneous rock. When the power shifted into a Hydro-Quebec line, the surge caused relays designed to sense overloads to trip on a 100-ton capacitor. This caused a cascade of capacitor failures, and Odenwall writes, the fate of the network had been sealed in barely 59 seconds, as the entire 9,460-megawatt output from Hydro-Quebec's Le Grand Hydroelectric Complex found itself without proper regulation. The Science Times writes, An extremely severe magnetic disturbance was observed. It caused electrical currents to run through much of North America's subsurface. At approximately 2.44 a.m. on March 13th, the winds discovered a lapse in Quebec's electrical system. The whole Quebec power grid lost electricity in less than two minutes. Millions of people were suddenly trapped in dark office buildings, underground pedestrian tunnels, and stuck elevators throughout the 12-hour blackout that followed. Most of the folks had cold homes for breakfast when they awoke. The Montreal Metro remained closed throughout the morning rush hour. Dorval Airport was shut down, and schools and businesses were closed due to the blackout. As severe as this outage was, it could have been much larger. The power loss cascaded into the United States. The Science Times writes, Fortunately, the United States had enough power available at the time, but barely. Within minutes of the storm's beginning on March 13th, there were over 200 power grid issues across the country from coast to coast. But thankfully, none of these led to a blackout. Odenwall notes, All that prevented 50 million more people in the U.S. from joining their Canadian friends in the dark were a dozen or so heroic capacitors on the Allegheny Power Network. Bettler noted that previous research had been done on the effect of CMEs on power grids, but the possibility of equipment damage or significant effects on the system operation had generally been discounted. But he determined that March 13, 1989 was different because there were two successive CMEs. Essentially, the first disrupted the magnetosphere, allowing the second to arrive more quickly. And it was that rapid onset that triggered the grid collapse. This was particularly disturbing because while March 13, 1989 was the largest magnetic storm of the 20th century, the grid collapse was well before the storm had reached its peak.
In the end, perhaps what is most surprising about the great geomagnetic storm of 1989 is that it was almost missed by the public at large outside of Quebec. Odenwald argues that the Quebec blackout was in many ways a sanitized event that was not reported on in major metropolitan newspapers outside of Canada. For most of the rest of the world, this great geomagnetic storm was nothing more than pretty northern lights. But not so for power companies and for space scientists, for whom the event has become what Odenwald describes as near legendary in status, and Battler describes as the archetypal disturbance for examining the geomagnetic hazard to power systems. That is, while the rest of the world was looking at the pretty northern lights, power companies and space scientists were developing a better understanding of and better standards protection from geomagnetic hazards in future storms. Still, Odenwells argues that we have much more to do, because we are more dependent than ever on technologies that might be impacted by such events. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy, and if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop or book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo. 